Welcome back everybody to the Ramsey Centre Lectures and to the second part of Peter Baldwin's talk entitled Turning Back the Woke Tide. I liken the pervasive grip that the wokest ideology has achieved in Western societies to an evil spell. It is a spell that works by fear, the fear that offending against identitarian norms and orthodoxies will result in social and professional death, and that hardly anyone, irrespective of procedural standing, is immune. Innumerable examples can be cited, but I'll run through a number that exemplify the problem and are revealing in different ways. Sir Tim Hunt is a distinguished British scientist, a Nobel laureate in medicine, no less, a fellow of the Royal Society, a founder of the European Research Council, an emeritus professor at University College London. A couple of years ago, he spoke at a conference of women science journalists in Seoul. In his address, he made a few feeble jokes about women in the laboratory, the danger of falling in love with them, that they sometimes burst into tears. He then told the audience that they should take no notice of the prejudices of an old codger like him, and that it was very important for young women to go into science, that they had a vital contribution to make. The comments were obviously self-deprecatory and strongly supportive of women in science. However, this set off a Twitter storm based on an incomplete report of what he had said that omitted the final part where he stressed women should go into science. It went viral as he was flying home to London. Shortly after his plane touched down, he was forced to resign from University College London, disowned by the Royal Society and the European Research Council, and anathematized in front page newspaper stories. Nothing could rescue his reputation. He made a groveling apology. Distinguished scientific colleagues, including Stephen Hawking and some woman scientists who had worked with him, rallied to his defense. All to no avail, his distinguished career uh, was effectively ended within 48 hours. Second example, in the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election, the impeccably liberal Columbia University's humanita humanities professor, Mark Lilla, wrote an article for the New York Times titled, The End of Identity Liberalism, in which he argued that, quote, American liberalism has slipped into a kind of moral panic about racial, gender, and sexual identity that has distorted liberalism's messages and prevented it from becoming a unifying force capable of governing. The fixation on diversity in our schools and in the press has produced a generation of liberals and progressives narcissistically unaware of conditions outside their self-defined groups and indifferent to the task of reaching out to Americans in every walk of life, end quote. Lilla is a committed partisan for the Democratic Party, and in interviews, he makes clear his main objection to identity politics is that the alienation of the white working class, a key component of the Democratic coalition since FDR, is a losing electoral strategy. It was a serious, carefully considered contribution that he later expanded to book length. The response was widespread vilification from American left liberals, including an article by a Columbia colleague law professor Catherine Frank, who accused him of, you guessed it, white supremacy, and placed him in the same ideological camp as David Duke. Quote from the article, Duke and Lilla were contributing to the same ideological project, the former cloaked in a KKK hood, the latter in an academic gown, end quote. Not very nice, is it, waking up to read an article in one of the major national newspapers that brackets you with the Ku Klux Klan, just for querying the ident identitarian ideology. More recently, there's the case of Lawrence Fox, the popular TV actor and star of the crime series, Lewis. In January, he was a panelist on the BBC's Question Time program. The issue of Meghan Markle's departure from Britain came up. Was she a victim of racism? Fox was skeptical, to which the questioner suggested he was speaking as a privileged white male. Fox replied that he was born with white skin and that to deprecate people on this ground was itself racist. Q shock, horror, outrage, Twitter, melt, Twitter meltdown. Fox thought things might blow over within a week or so. To the contrary, the denunciations intensified and continue to this day. 
He was disowned by his own union, Equity, the British Actors Union. He relates how the outrage mob did not confine itself to him, but went after his family members. Offers of acting work dried up, and he is now he now has to consider his future career, all for expressing his view that deprecating white people was racist. And let's not forget what happened to Barry Spur, the first professor of poetry and poetics at Sydney University, a recognised global authority on T.S. Eliot and an extremely popular lecturer. After the leaking to the online rag Matilda of some private emails that he had posted to a handful of people that contained some terms that could be deemed racist, Spur came under ferocious, uh, ferocious attack by the PC mob. The university acted immediately, denouncing Spur to the media, banning him from setting foot on any university campus, even prohibiting him from clearing out his office. Spur was subjected to a terrible public humiliation. This all happened literally within a couple of days before even the formality of a hearing where he could present his case. This is how the university treated some with a 40, someone with a 40-year association with the university. He was subsequently forced to resign on terms that prohibited him from speaking publicly about the matter. This must surely rate as one of the most disgraceful episodes in the history of Australian higher education. These cases are emblematic of a number of things. The utter intolerance by the woke brigade of the slightest deviation from their orthodoxies, especially on the part of those like Jacinta Price, who depart from ident identitarian scripts uh, pertaining to their own identity, who merit special vilification as Uncle Tom's and the like. The demand for swift and peremptory justice for alleged infractions, a demand that all too often those in authority comply with at the first whiff of grape shot and the enormous force multiplier that social media, Twitter especially, provides to amplify these witch hunts. A particularly sinister aspect that we see all the time is the insistence on guilt by association. Punish first, substantiate the charges later, if at all. Hence in America, any police shooting uh, is automatically deemed a racist murder. Evidence to the contrary must be disregarded, as in the case of the Ferguson shooting, one of the original tri triggers of the Black Lives Matter movement that pseudo scholars of critical race theory and whiteness studies continue to call a racist murder and demand the officer involved be punished accordingly, despite conclusive evidence that it was nothing of the kind. A question often asked is, where are the adults in the room, the people in authority, who should be voices of restraint and moderation? The answer, sadly, is that all too often they are cringing under a table hoping they can sate the mob by issuing grovelling apologies and throwing a few people under the proverbial bus. As if that wasn't bad enough, things have gotten considerably worse with the radicalisation spiral that followed the George, George Floyd killing in Minneapolis in May. Since then, notions that a few months ago would have seemed clinically insane, like the demand to defund the police forces, have moved into the mainstream. All over the world, we see people from various backgrounds, including members of police forces, taking the su making the supine gesture of submission of taking a knee. In America, we see inner cities racked by rioting and mob violence that mainstream media insist on characterising as legitimate, essentially peaceful protest. So that is the situation we find ourselves in. We face a global movement to deprecate and undermine Western civilization, destroy free speech and replace it with an unchallengeable ideological orthodoxy enforced by threats of social obloquy, public humiliation and career destruction, and increasingly violent thuggery by masked, black-shirted shirted thugs who have the temerity to style themselves as anti-fascist. So how do we break the spell? The first point to note is that most normal people don't buy this stuff, especially the palpably crazy propositions like defunding the police. Polls across the Western world consistently show majority opposition to tearing down statues, the holding of demonstrations in defiance of COVID precautions, the ridiculous extremities of racial and gender politics and political correctness, and especially the violence. Furthermore, there is reason to believe that there is far more latent opposition to identitarian ideology in the general population than is apparent on the surface. 
In Britain, a poll by Gallup showed that around one third of the population uh, were afraid to express their real views on contentious issues, not least because of what, it, of what it might mean for their employment. The flip side is that tireless activism can inflate the apparent support of the wokists, especially the keyboard warriors of social media. For, ex for example, an outfit called Sleeping Giant has been quite successful in intimidating advertisers to boycott certain TV and radio programs in Australia. Yet in Australia, Sleeping Giant's Twitter campaigns are the work of a handful, actually several Twitter campaigners. As the old adage says, the squeaky wheel gets to grease. Yet mainstream politicians, corporate leaders and university vice chancellors and presidents around the world seem extraordinarily reluctant to take a stand against the activists. A number of people have spoken about the folly of apologizing for offending woke ideology. It is understandable that people do this, especially those in vulnerable occupations like teaching or the entertainment industry. But as cases like Sir Tim Hunt make clear, it is naive to think an apology will bring mercy. On the contrary, an apology is never accepted in good faith. Rather, it is taken as an admission of guilt. It acts like blood in the water in a shark tank. But even among those inclined to resist to some degree, there is far too much deference to wokers' claims, too much willingness to acknowledge the good intentions of the bullies. Take, for example, the UK Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, who described the Black Lives Matter demand that white people take a knee as, quote, a symbol of subjugation and subordination. He was immediately denounced by all the usual suspects, especially Labor and Liberal Democrat politicians, the leader of the latter demanding a fulsome apology. Well, credit to Raab for not submitting to that demand, but he did go on Twitter to say, quote, to be clear, I have full respect for the Black Lives Matter movement and the issues driving them, end quote. No, this is all too typical. Nobody has an issue with the proposition that Black Lives Matter. They matter every bit as much as the lives of any other racial or identity group. But the eponymous movement is utterly toxic. It is a violent racist movement founded by Marxist ideologues and has a Marxist agenda to dismantle the existing social order. Why on earth is a conservative politician expressing respect for a group like that? And that is typical of activist social justice, in scare quotes, movements. BLM is totally indifferent to the consequences of its activities. It does not care about black lives unless they conform to its preferred narrative of racist oppression. The number of blacks who die from black on black gang violence exceeds by several orders of magnitude the number of racial, genuine racially motivated police shootings. Indeed, there is overwhelming evidence that BLM activities, especially after the Ferguson shooting, have contribute, contributed to thousands of excess black deaths as police are intimidated into stepping back from the proactive measures, uh, policing measures that have been so effective in reducing homicide rates in recent decades. There's been a similar surge in black homicide deaths in major cities since the Floyd incident, including a nearly 200% increase in New York City this July compared to last year. BLM could not care less about this, nor about the destruction wrought on black neighborhoods, the businesses shut down or fleeing the area, the urban desolation that their rioting has brought in its wake. Here is my view. The time for tepid qualified opposition to this ideology is over. It needs to be tackled comprehensively. We should not accept how these people frame issues. We should not, we, we should reject their nomenclature and we should contest the theories hatched in academia over decades that rationalize their causes. I think we might be encouraged by how this might be received, even by those who see themselves as leftists. Having done a number of talks and articles about this over the past several years, including my recent piece in the Weekend Australian, I've often found myself pushing on an open door, even with left-leaning audiences. Many people sense there is something deeply wrong with this ideology, something profoundly counterintuitive for genuine progressives, even if they are hesitant to express it and are relieved when somebody spells it out. I think there's a special obligation to speak up on the part of those who, like me, are relatively invulnerable, invulnerable to retaliation from the activists. Consider the matter of race and racism. 
In most people's common sense understanding, a racist is someone disposed to think Ill, Ill of or discriminate against a person simply in virtue of his or her race, understood to refer to surface physical features like skin colour. Anti-racists of an earlier generation urged that race was something we should aspire to transcend, so that in the words of Martin Luther King, we are judged by the content of our character, not the colour of our skin. If we accept this definition, how is it not racist to constantly deprecate white people as a class, as is common in wokeist circles, or to liken being white to a tremendous or even radical sin? It was done by the head of the ABC's religion and ethics website on a radio national program. Imagine the reaction if black or brown was substituted for white. How can they justify this? Well, just like Humpty Dumpty in Alice in Wonderland, they redefine the term to mean just what they want it to mean, no more, no less. According to the academic critical race theorists, it is impossible for people of colour to be racist against white people. They can be prejudiced, perhaps, but not racist, since according to their definition, racism equals prejudice plus power. So they narrow the definition, so all this anti-white people rhetoric is held to be legitimate, or at most a misdemeanor. Hence the New York Times can welcome, welcome onto its esteemed editorial board a young woman whose Twitter feed is full of anti-white bile, including one about how much she enjoys being cruel to old white men. On the other hand, they want to broaden the definition of racism when it suits them. So that, for example, it can encompass criticism of Islam, since according to the theorists, Islam has been racialized and is thus an oppressed identity. I won't bother to labor the absurdity of this kind of theorizing. The distinguished black American intellectual Thomas Sowles pointed out that according to racism equals prejudice plus power definition, Hitler would not have been a racist when he ranted against Jews as an impoverished denizen of Vienna Doss houses before World War I, only morphing into a racist when he entered the Reich Chancellery. The obvious circularity in arguing that opposition to Islam is racist because Islam is racialized needs no emphasis. On any reasonable definition, all this anti-white people talk is racist, plain vanilla racism, if you'll excuse the pun. The ideology and the theories that underpin it are atavistic and reactionary. I think this is a case that can and should be made not least to people who identify as leftists. Which brings me to my final point. We need to assemble a broad coalition if this battle for civilizational survival is to be won. It should not be seen as something solely for conservatives, and we should resist characterizing any leftists who support it as having defected wholesale to the conservative camp. Rather, we need to reconstitute something like the Cold War coalition of conservatives, liberals and social democrats who will no doubt disagree about all manner of things but unite in defense of the foundations of our free liberal and democratic civilization. Well Peter, thanks again. That's certainly pretty hard-hitting stuff. Now here are two thoughts or questions for your comment if you could. I'll ask both together if I may and then over to you to answer as, as you see fit. The first one you may think is a bit tangential perhaps, but how much of the heat generated by the protests of recent months, initially sparked of course by those dreadful images of the George Floyd killing, without, without downplaying the genuine horror of this tragedy or, or the importance of the BLM movement, how much of all of this do you think could we put down to the pandemic lockdown? Too many young people, irrespective of race, cooped up for too long with only social media for company, getting angrier and angrier, a bit like a bushfire burning away, building momentum in a remote valley, suddenly bursts out into inhabited territory. So that's one thought. And the other one for your comment is to do with your point about identitarian ideology in general. I'm talking about the bigger picture now, not really about some Black Lives Matter anymore. Uh, and I'm interested in your comments about the latent opposition to this kind of ideology in the wider population, with many people afraid to express their real views, as you said. Now, of course, everyone needs an identity, no problem with that, but that isn't what we're talking about here, I think. It's not what you're talking about. And you know, what this reminds me of more than anything is those very famous words 
of John Stuart Mill from On Liberty, which is almost the Bible of modern liberalism, where he says, I'm quoting here, the will of the people, moreover, practically means the will of the most numerous or the most active part of the people, the majority, or those who succeed in making themselves accepted as the majority. Society can and does execute its own mandates. This is still Mill. And if it issues wrong mandates instead of right, or any mandates at all in things with which it ought not to meddle, then it practices a social tyranny more formidable than many kinds of political oppression, since though not usually upheld by such extreme penalties, it leaves fewer means of escape and penetrates much more deeply into the details of life and even enslaving the soul itself. Now, of course, this is the famous formulation by Mill of what's called the tyranny of the majority. So I wonder if you'd comment whether you'd agree that what we're witnessing here with the identitarian movement in general, and just to stress again, I'm not talking about BLN specifically, that what we're witnessing here is exactly what Mill warned us about. That is a part of the population, arguably a neo-Marxist part, which has succeeded in making itself accepted as the majority, when it is really just the noisiest part, and trying to silence the voices of the actual majority, which we might call the silent majority. So could you comment on that? It's an interesting question, just what the impact of the lockdowns has been. I haven't seen any research on it, but I suspect, um, uh, you know, people being confined to their houses and with nothing much better to do than marinate in um, social media might uh, uh, might be a contributory factor. But uh, bear in mind that we've similar upsurges have gone on for a number of years now, uh, although not as widespread and not as um, persistent. Um, rather than the lockdowns, I, I tend to suspect that the great force multiplier in driving the proliferation of these campaigns is uh, more likely to be the increasing use of social media. So that uh, a meme can kind of go viral globally in a, in, in a matter of hours. And uh, so, you know, something like the global upsurge following, followed the George Floyd killing, uh, I think it would only be conceivable in, in an age of social media. Um, but I, I don't know exactly what, how much the, the lockdowns have, have exacerbated that. I suspect they have to a degree. But on the, your point about Mill and the, uh, uh, the way in which a, a minority can actually uh, successfully achieve the, a result that they want to achieve, I, I think the, um, the Black Lives Matter movement um, really highlights that. If we look at black people specifically, um, what do they think about the police? Do they want to be rid of the police or do they, um, or do they, they want to see much less of the police? Uh, uh, apart from the activists, uh, what's the situation? Well, actually uh, Gallup did a survey on that, uh, in, which was, came out in August this year, and it was rather striking. Uh, of the black people surveyed, 81 percent wanted to wanted uh, uh, the level of police interaction in their communities to be at least as high, and a substantial proportion, around about 20 percent, wanted to, to see more of it. If you had those who wanted it kept about the same, and those who wanted an increase in police presence, of you, that's 81 percent, compared to 19 percent who wanted a diminished police presence. So. Uh, that's perfectly understandable, of course, because uh, black people are not insane any more than anybody else. And um, the, the effect of wholesale withdrawal of police and defunding of police would uh, leave them vulnerable to living in an environment with, uh, dominated by unrestricted gang violence. And uh, no rational people would actually want that. And I think that those sort of sentiments are confirmed by focus groups as well. But um, the problem you have is that, uh, you know, the silent majority, if you like, um, uh, are often very afraid to speak. Um, in the, um, 
uh, you know, because according to the theorists who, who, who kind of provide the, you know, the underpinning for, for a lot of this form of activism, especially among more educated people and the universities and so forth, um, black people or members of any uh, oppressed minority uh, are expected to speak with one voice. Uh, Ayanna Presley, who's one of the the, uh, the squad of four radical Democrat Party uh, congressional members, she she uh, expressed it in a speech I, I saw, uh, which uh, where she said, "We don't want black faces that aren't black voices. We don't want brown any more brown voices, brown faces that aren't brown voices." you know, everybody's got to speak and stick to the script. And uh, failure to do that typically um, results in people being uh, denounced as Uncle Toms or uh, there's, a, there's a new term creeping into academic discourse called native informers. These are, if you like, identity traitors, people who, uh, you know, commit a kind of act of betrayal by, by, by not... Um, Sticking to the the script that people of their identity are expect to adhere to, expected to adhere to, and this comes up uh, in a number of contexts. There's a, a very good speech on YouTube by a young woman from a Pakistani Muslim background, an address she gave to the uh, uh, United States Humanist Association, where she she described how and and this uh, Sarah Hayder. Uh, actually defected from Islam and became a, a public critic of it and set up a, an organization of ex-Muslims. And she, she basically said that uh, all her, she expected to be denounced by Islamists when she did this, but uh, she got equal uh, vilification from her erstwhile colleagues on, on the liberal left. And, and she still sees herself as a, as a leftist. But uh, she talked very persuasively about that. So there's a, there's a, a, a to a large degree, it's, you know, there's an enforcement of a kind of discipline about what is sayable. And um, you really are taking a bit of a risk in some contexts uh, if you depart from what woke ideology says is the appropriate sort of thing for you to be saying. And uh, of course, um, the the ideologists, uh, you know, as a result of what um, Mark Kuser and Rudy Dushki called the long march through the institutions, are able to exert a, a disproportionate influence in, in, in a whole range of contexts, including obviously academia and the education system more generally, but increasing, increasingly uh, media, politics, the bureaucracy. There's even a, uh, a report the other day about a... Um, employees working at the Sandia National Laboratory in America, which uh, is responsible for designing nuclear weapons, uh, being compelled to uh, participate in classes on critical race theory and whiteness theory and so forth. So um, this is this, this way of looking at, uh, where, according to the theorists, where people who depart are not regarded as authentic voices and, and can be safely disregarded. So you can have 80% of black people who don't think getting rid of the police is a or reducing the, the police is a, is a particularly good idea, but they're not the voices you hear anything like as loudly. And again, um, the bottom line is the, the woke ideologists really don't speak on behalf of or act in the interests of those they claim to champion.